Wait, hang on, hang on. All the way down here. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Good morning, Ross. It's happy Easter. Go ahead and stay with us together. I was buried in my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not
Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity to gather together on this Easter Sunday to worship you and lift our hearts to you and thank you for the fact that 2,000 years ago, the stone was, stone was rolled away from in front of that tomb and your son walked out of the grave never to die again. We thank you that death no longer has dominion over him. We thank you for the newness of life that he offers to us. And we thank you for the hope of the resurrection that we will share with him one day. We love you. We thank you for all your goodness to us. And we pray all these things in the name of the risen and reigning Lord Jesus. Amen. Happy Easter, Horizons. Will you say hello to your neighbor before you sit down? everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. Thank you so much for coming out and worshiping and celebrating the most important day in human history with us. If we've not yet met, my name is Josiah Pitts. I'm the assistant campus pastor here at Lost Creek Campus. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us today, especially if you are new, recent, this is your first time here. We would love the opportunity to meet you. Uh, myself, and Pastor Steve, and my father, Quint Pitts, will be delivering the message today. And when we're done preaching, we'll be right over there at that welcome area over there to your left. Love to give you a gift and tell you a little bit about the church if you're new, all right? If you haven't downloaded the app yet, we encourage you to do that. Got all kinds of neat in-service tools that you can utilize there, including connection card and sermon notes. And we've actually got a physical uh, connection card handout available to you now. So if you've uh, updated any of your information, got prayer requests, anything, you can just fill that out, drop it in the bucket on your way out today, okay? And then we also have uh, giving. So to those of you who've continued to partner with us financially to make the ministry that we do here possible, thank you so much. Uh, your, uh, your giving is what makes it possible for us to do all the stuff that we do here, including our Easter offering. We've got that going on right now. And every penny of that goes to our Cambodian orphan homes. So if you uh, would like to give to that, you can grab one of those envelopes out in the back, just mark it Easter and drop it in the buckets, or you can utilize any of those methods up there on the screen to give, okay? The only other thing I've got is baptisms are coming up next weekend. If that's your next step, you've not yet, uh, somebody's excited about that, one guy, one guy's excited about that, and it's the guy who's paid to be excited about it, so... <laughs> Anyway, we got baptisms coming up next weekend, so uh, if that's your next step and you need to do that, you can take the class online at horizonschurch.net, get that filled out, and we will get you baptized next week, all right? And finally, over to my left and your right is our prayer room. We got someone in there praying for us right now. If at any point during the service you need prayer, please feel free to utilize that, okay? Got a couple quick video announcements, and then my father will be up to deliver the first part of our Easter message entitled The Ultimate Plot Twist. So take a look at the big screens, and then he'll be up to deliver the message. Hi everyone, my name is Valerie McCord and I am the administrative pastor here at Horizons. I wanted to invite youth ages 12 to 18 to our Easter celebration. Whether you come every week or if you've never come at all, we encourage you to join us on April 20th from 6.30 to 8.30 in our youth building. We're gonna have a message, worship, snacks, and I hear there's a rumor we may have an Easter egg hunt. We wanna take time to celebrate the hope we have in Jesus with all of you. So we encourage you to bring a friend and we can't wait to see you there. We are about to listen to a message taught from God's Word. This is one of the most important parts of our gathering. Therefore, we ask you to silence your cell phone, not engage in conversation, and not allow your child to cause a distraction. If your little one does create a distraction, we kindly ask you to respect those around you by taking your child to our clean, safe nursery, using our family viewing area in the cafe, or one of our cry rooms located behind you, where you can see and hear everything and your child will appreciate the extra freedom.
Hey, I want to welcome in those of you worshiping with us at our other campuses around West Virginia. Thank you all for being here. Those of you in the room, thanks for being here with us today. If you were here a couple weeks ago, I told you a story about a girl I met as a freshman at Liberty Baptist College. She's kind. She's compassionate. We hit it off immediately. We become fast friends. She really impresses me. And Shauna certainly isn't the only person like her at Liberty Baptist my freshman year. A lot of people were in that category. But like every college... Not everyone fits into the wonderful person category. You know, there's actually some jerks at Liberty Baptist too. And I met my fair share of jerks that first year. One jerk kind of stands out in particular. His name is Cordell Woodowis. Everybody calls this guy Woody. I think it's because his brain is made of wood, you know. Uh, I mean, if, if IQ points were fertilizer, Woody couldn't grow a turnip. That's what, that's what I think about him. You know, uh, Woody's a jock. He's a jock. All he can talk about is sports, man. It's all, you know, I mean, I like sports as much as the next man, but this guy is a one play playlist. Uh, It's his high school football team. It's Notre Dame football. It's the Green Bay Packers, for crying out loud. I mean, the guy's got no taste even in football, but that's all he talks about. He doesn't have the IQ to carry on a serious conversation, even if he had the nerve to try it. But worse yet, Woody is a reprobate. He's a fake. He's a phony Christian. Uh, You know, and and guys like him, I don't like guys like him because they have to lie on the application, you know. To get into this Baptist school, you have to say you're a Christian, and and he just lies on the application because he's not a Christian at all, you know. Uh, I don't like him, but you know what? He doesn't like me either, so we're even. Uh, In fact, I heard his roommate say, uh, yeah, that Pitts guy, I think he's a spoiled mama's boy. Yeah, he's not too smart. Not very smart at all. So anyway, like I said, uh, he certainly doesn't belong at Liberty Baptist College. Now, some people are just really good at identifying phonies, right? I mean, I certainly put myself in that category when I was at the ripe, wise old age of 18. I mean, I could spot a phony coming from a mile away. And, you know, some people are just really good at that, people that are streetwise. Now, I'm not, I don't consider myself streetwise at 18, but you know the kind of person I'm talking about, people who have to live by their wits constantly, uh, people who are living kind of in violent environments or insecure environments, they have to live by their wits, and they have to be able to identify a phony. I would put professional criminals in that, in that category category, right? Career criminals, they have to be able to identify phonies because their survival sometimes depends on it. And they can especially, I think, identify religious phonies. Well, that awful, beautiful day in Jerusalem when Jesus is crucified, Jesus is crucified between two of these professional criminal types. The Gospels call them thieves. They are not the kind of romantic figures that you think of when you think about a thief. You know, they're not Robin Hood stealing from the rich to give to the poor. They're not harmless burglars who kind of sneak into your house and steal your bread when you're not at home. These guys, the guys that get crucified as thieves are bandits. They're highwaymen. They're, they're the kind of guys that ambush you while you're alone and defenseless on the Jericho Road. They beat you into unconsciousness, and then they leave you bleeding, and they leave you penniless or worse. And these are the two guys. These two guys are the kind of guys who are crucified with Jesus. They're bad boys. They're, they're like corn pop. They're bad boys, and they run with bad dudes. You're the only crowd that laughed at that line. I'm so glad that you're here today. Friday night, they didn't laugh at it. Saturday night, they just stared at me. Thank you for coming today. Uh, Yes. I I I want to take you all home with me so I'll feel better about myself. All right. So anyway, when they nailed up Jesus... Uh, they nailed these two thieves beside him. And as they are hoisted up between or or on either side of Jesus, they notice that placard above Jesus' head. He's a religious teacher, right? But the placard above it says, says, King of the Jews. And immediately these two guys smell a rat, right? They, They are good at identifying phonies. And they think we have to die now in the presence of a phony religious charlatan. So they're convinced of it. And because of that, they can't resist the irony of it. And so they start doing what everybody else is doing that day. The mob is ridiculing Jesus. They're mocking Jesus. They're hurling insults at him. And guess what? The two dying thieves decide to join right in. Here's how Mark's gospel describes it. If you got your Bible, it's Mark chapter 15. Here's how he describes the scene. He says, "Uh, those who pass by hurled insults at him, Jesus, shaking their heads and saying, so You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. They said, he saved others. 
They said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And almost as an afterthought, Mark adds this detail. Those crucified with him, these two career criminals, also heaped insults on him. So it's not enough that Jesus is dying in agony. It's not enough that he's being slowly tortured to death. These thieves dying with him add insults to his injury. Now, I guess you might expect that from you know, that kind of hatred, maybe you expect that from career criminals. I don't know. But what about you and me? What about you and me? We also often, when we are convinced that we've identified a phony, sometimes we're wrong about that, aren't we? I mean, some people have even had the audacity to suggest that I am wrong about identifying people like that. And we all know at Horizon, we all know I'm never wrong. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that one. But we, I'm often a little weak on being right. Uh, so, you, you know, some of you have had that too. I'm going to put a picture up right now. And this is a picture of me. I'm the handsome guy on the left. I'm on a missions trip to Ecuador. This is 1990. That's why I look so different. <laughs> this is 1990. I'm on a mission trip to Ecuador. Guess who the guy is on the right? Woody, you guessed it, that reprobate jock. Uh, with an empty head. He's, he's actually down there in the, in, he's a phony baloney classic banana Christian, but he's out there spreading the gospel with me among the Quechua Indians. Uh, yeah, I was a little weak on being right about Woody. Uh, in fact, uh, six months before that picture's taken, Woody was the best man at my wedding. Three years after that picture, I was the best man at his wedding. I've got pictures of him and I uh, vacationing in uh, South Carolina, vacationing in Tennessee. I've got pictures of us riding in the white water of the New River, uh, boogie boarding in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I've got pictures of him backpacking with me in Virginia, West Virginia. We've got pictures of me visiting his family in Indiana, him visiting my family in West Virginia. I put this picture up. This picture is me and Woody getting together again, uh, watching some baseball games at our old alma mater, alma mater, Liberty University. That picture was taken last weekend. We've been best of friends for 40 years now. I was a little weak on being right about him. Uh, he actually loves God. He always has loved God, and he is a pretty smart guy. He's still a Packers fan, so you can't fix stupid. <laughs> so... Sometimes we're not right in our assessments, right? There's a little plot twist there. Uh, many of you can tell similar stories. In fact, some of you are sitting beside your spouse today, and you weren't too impressed with them the first time you saw them, right? <laughs> don't, don't raise your hand. I don't want to see that. <laughs> All right. So anyway, first impressions are often wrong. And many of you made some first impression assumptions about Jesus himself. And I certainly put myself in that category. I didn't think Jesus was a phony like the thieves on the cross. I thought Jesus was completely irrelevant. You know, he was this ancient historical figure, and I'm sure he was sincere and authentic and all that, but totally irrelevant to me. And just like me, many of you had that same assumption. And now, not only is Jesus relevant to your life, he's the center of your life. He's the Lord of your life. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, these dying criminals, they are convinced that Jesus is a shady charlatan. He is a make-believe Messiah. But then something unexpected happens. After listening to insults and mockery and jeers all morning long, Jesus decides to speak from the cross. So he pushes himself up on those nails, and everybody leans in. They want to hear, what is he going to say? What is he going to do? Is he going to recant? Is he going to apologize for all the people he misled and all the people he lied to? Is he going to lash out at the people who are jeering at him? Is he going to curse those who are cursing him? Jesus doesn't do any of that. He does something totally unexpected. In a, in, a, in a plot twist that's filled with plot twists, a day that's filled with plot twists, he says something that even to this day people shake their heads. Here's what Jesus says. The first words he utters from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It is unthinkable that a man can pray for grace and forgiveness to be poured out upon the people who are murdering him at the time that they are murdering him and abusing him and torturing him. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He forgives his torturers. And then that a moment of amazing grace, it totally rocks the world of one of these thieves, these professional criminals that's dying beside him. It, this, this, this grace act 
that Jesus pours out, it grabs this thief by the throat and he totally changes his tune. He totally becomes a different man. In a moment of clarity, this career criminal cries out and he says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wow. You talk about a plot twist. This guy is convinced he's got a phony, and now he's calling him a king. He's saying, this guy's going to have a king. And by the way, he's also in this little prayer. It's not much of a sinner's prayer, but he reveals something. He, he reveals that he thinks Jesus is going to outlive this day. Somehow, some way, Jesus is going to keep on going, and he's going to become a king someday in his kingdom. And he, he wants Jesus to remember him. Again, it's not much of a sinner's prayer, but Jesus, in typical Jesus fashion, he pours out grace on this dying thief, and he, he gives him a promise. He says, today... You will be with me in paradise. Wow. Now, Josiah told this story from Alistair Begg recently, and I I just can't resist adding it here today because you know that an hour or two after this little exchange between Jesus and this career criminal, you know he dies, right? The career criminal dies. He draws his last breath, and suddenly, immediately, he finds himself at the gates of paradise. Can you imagine how that meeting went? You know, there's an angel there at the gate, you know, and you imagine he kind of shuffles up to the gate and the angel says to him, says, what's your name? And he looks up his record and the angel is shocked because all he sees is violence and all he sees is crime. And in fact, he sees that earlier today he was mocking and cursing Jesus himself. And, and the angel says, why, why, do you, why are you here? And the, and the thief says, well, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, hold on. I got to go get my supervisor angel. So he goes and grabs his supervisor angel. Supervisor comes back and says, look, we got a few questions for you. All right. First of all, are you clear about the doctrine of justification by faith? Never heard of it. Um, Well, hmm. What about baptism? You've been water baptized. What's baptism? Shaking his head, you know, the angel says, well, Scripture? You have, what's your idea of the Bible and Scripture? He just stares back at him blankly. Finally, flustered, the angel says, well, what in the world makes you think you have the right to be here? And to that, the thief said, the man on the middle cross, he said I could come. And folks, that's all we got to go on, man. In the end, that's all we got to go on. What a plot twist. This guy starts off the day cursing Jesus. And now Jesus is the Lord of his life. And, and that thief has been living in heaven for 2,000 years. It's not the only plot twist that Good Friday. For the centurion who was overseeing the executions on that fateful Good Friday, it was going to be a long, boring day. His normal duties included leading a group of 100 soldiers into the glories of battle and conquest. But today, he was stuck walking through the crowded and dirty streets of Jerusalem to do Rome's far less glorious, more seedy work. He was leading three condemned men, three common criminals, out of the city and out to a place called Golgotha, which is aptly named the place of the skull. And there, after those three criminals and the soldiers trudged up that hill, the three condemned men were laid down on crosses. Four Roman soldiers were assigned to each criminal. Two to hold the arms down and pin them against the cross beam. One soldier to hold the feet together. And one to take a set of Roman spikes and a hammer and drive them into the hands and heels of those men and pin them to the cross. After that was done, those crosses were then lifted up, set down in shallow holes so that they could stand tall for anyone and everyone who passed by to see. But the horrific sight of crucifixion, a sight that most people couldn't bear to look at for more than a few moments, was just a bunch of static to this centurion and his 12 comrades. Because the close and personal nature of sword-to-sword combat in those days meant that you had to desensitize yourself to gratuitous violence pretty quickly if you wanted to make it as a soldier. And so, on that day that Jesus was crucified... The women who followed him stood at the foot of the cross and wept and wailed and passers-by wagged their heads and averted their eyes and the religious leaders mocked Jesus mercilessly and gleefully. But those 
12 soldiers and that centurion, who'd long been deadened to the sight of such grisly horrors, did what they always did at crucifixions like these. They drank and they gambled. In fact, they were specifically gambling for the garments of Jesus, that man on the middle cross. They were throwing dice for his clothes as if they were playing a casual game of craps instead of presiding over a public execution. It's just another day in the Roman army. But there were two curious details about that man on the middle cross that caught the centurion's eye. Two fascinating blips in the plot of an otherwise straight-to-formula story of Roman execution. Because even though he had no reason to believe that this man, Jesus, was anything other than a common criminal, there had been, first of all, the interesting fact that the Roman prefect, Pontius Pilate, who was in charge of that area, had commanded a sign to be nailed above Jesus' head. A sign written in Latin, Aramaic, and Greek, which meant that basically anyone in the world at that time could have read it. A sign that read, King of the Jews. And then there was the interesting tidbit about Jesus' own countrymen, those religious leaders who were standing at the cross and mocking him derisively in ways he'd never heard before, saying things like, Why don't you come down from that cross if you really are the Son of God? I'm willing to bet that centurion had presided over a lot of crucifixions during his time. But I'm also willing to bet he had never presided over the crucifixion of a man who was called King of the Jews by a Roman prefect and who was derisively called the Son of God by his own countrymen. Now, Other than those two curiosities, it was still the same old, same old, as far as the centurion was concerned. Until, without any warning whatsoever, it was decidedly not the same old, same old. Because at high noon, suddenly a great darkness covered the land, and it was as if midday had turned into midnight. But the sky wasn't the only thing that looked like it had gone completely dark. Because as the centurion kept watching that man on the middle cross, that man named Jesus, that man who he thought was nothing more than a common criminal, it started to look to him like Jesus' sufferings went deeper than the nails in his hands and the flayed flesh on his back. Because it looked to that centurion like somehow Jesus was bearing up not just his own weight, but the weight of all the world the weight of all of its sin and its misery and its wickedness and its sorrow, all of it was falling somehow, it looked like, on his shoulders. And then after three hours of this inexplicable darkness of both sky and soul, the centurion heard Jesus cry out in the kind of agony that you only hear in your worst nightmares. As Jesus screamed at the top of his lungs, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The words were hoarse and garbled coming out of his mouth, so bystander grabbed a sponge, soaked it in wine vinegar, put it on his staff, and hoisted it up to Jesus' lips so he could take a drink, clear his throat, and try one more time. The next thing the centurion heard, though, was a loud cry from this king of the Jews, this so-called son of God this common criminal who then bowed his head and cried out no more. And that should have been the end of the story. The death of yet another common criminal on a Roman cross made just a little more interesting by that interesting sign above his head, the mockery of his countrymen, and the mysterious darkness. But the story did not end there. Because just as Jesus breathed his last, that centurion felt the ground beneath his feet begin to tremble. He looked down and see pebbles begin to vibrate like coins on top of a running dryer. And then the, the, the quaking and the shaking became so violent that rocks began to split. And the large tombs that were rolled, the large stones that were rolled in front of the tombs cracked and split. And people began walking out of the tombs. As the centurion and his comrades saw all of this, their eyes opened wide in terror and their hearts began to race because they had never known a common criminal's execution to literally shake the earth itself and do things like that. 
And so the formulaic story of Roman execution had taken a very significant plot twist. And the centurion realized with great fear that maybe, just maybe, he had not been party to the execution of just any common criminal. But that perhaps he had done something far more terrible than that. Because maybe, just maybe, that sign that hung above Jesus' head and those taunts that came out of his mockers' mouths, maybe they were all true. And we read in Matthew 27, 54, when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Now, we don't know what became of the centurion after this day, but what we know is this. He, as a non-Jewish Roman soldier, could see clearly what Jesus' own countrymen could not. Because he saw all those signs, and he understood that Jesus was not just a common criminal, but that he was the Christ, the Son of God. His eyes were open to see the literally earth-shaking effects of Christ's death. And so he confessed the truth perhaps better than he knew. And perhaps in ways he didn't fully understand. Surely this man, Jesus, was the Son of God. But now the question is, will we do likewise? Because if we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, we will find that Christ's death didn't just change the physical landscape of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Because when Jesus died on that cross 2,000 years ago, he wasn't dying a rebel's death as a common criminal. Rather, he was dying as the Son of God who loved us and willingly gave himself up on the cross for us. Because he was shedding blood that just but one drop of has the worth to win all the world forgiveness of its world of sin. Even though theologies and doctrines can be debated, the lives shaken and changed by Christ cannot be denied. Now, we're free to ignore this signs if we want to, like Jesus' countrymen did. Or we can look at these signs with wide open eyes, and we can confess along with that centurion, surely this man Jesus is the Son of God. But at the end of that Good Friday 2,000 years ago, the centurion watched as Jesus' body was taken down from that cross, wrapped in linen, and carried away to a nearby tomb. Because not even, as it turned out, God's own son could escape the grip of the grave. But as the women returned home to sleeplessly mourn, and as the disciples hid in fear and shame, and as the Pharisees so restlessly tried to make sure that Jesus' story really and truly had come to an end, the Son of God rested in peace. His work was finished. And it looked to all the onlookers as if he was finished too. And so as his friends buried all their hopes and dreams of that kingdom he had proclaimed and laid those those hopes in the tomb with his body, they waited. Because as it turned out, God had just one more plot twist up his sleeve. Mary Magdalene knew evil. She'd had a personal relationship with it for years before she met Jesus. And so when she saw the sadistic pleasure of the soldiers as they tortured Jesus and that That haunting glee in the eyes of those who mocked him, she knew what she was looking at. 
The religious leaders could call it justice. The Roman soldiers could say they're just doing their duty. But Mary knew what this was. It was orchestrated evil. This was no execution. This was her old master, Satan, spiking the ball. This was evil's victory dance. And a few years ago, Mary would have been right in the middle of that dance. But she met Jesus, and he freed her from a bondage that, had been, that she'd been trapped in for years. You see, Mary was from a little town called Magdala on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And because she was from that town, people called her Mary Magdalene or Mary of Magdala. But for years, the people of that town avoided her because it was obvious to everyone in Magdala that there was something very wrong with Mary. I mean, there was a darkness that lived within her. There was something that was tormenting her. And so everyone in Magdala just stayed away from Mary. That is, until Jesus came to town. Now, we don't know if Jesus sought out Mary or Mary sought out Jesus, but we do know that when they met, Jesus understood her torment, and he freed her from that darkness that was living inside of her. And Mary's life was so transformed by Jesus that from that day forward, whenever anyone spoke of Mary, they always added, the one from whom Jesus cast out seven demons. You see, Mary knew evil. She'd had a personal relationship with it for years. But then she met Jesus, and everything changed. But when Jesus freed men and women from the horrors of demon possession, they were often so grateful for their new life that they wanted to be wherever Jesus was, and they wanted to help him do for others what he'd done for them. I mean, when Jesus uh, crossed the Sea of Galilee and he freed a demoniac who was living in tombs and cutting himself with stones over there, that transformed man, that changed man was, was so grateful for his new life that when Jesus got ready to leave, he asked a few people with him. Jesus said no, because he wanted this transformed man to stay in Gadara, and he wanted him to be a witness to his neighbors. But when Mary made a similar request of Jesus, he said yes. And in Luke chapter 8, verse 3, we're told that Mary became part of a group of women who went wherever Jesus went and helped support his ministry out of their own funds. After her deliverance, few people loved Jesus as deeply as Mary did, which is why she never left Jesus' side during the horrors of the crucifixion. I mean, Judas wasn't there. He'd betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Ten of the 11 disciples, they were no-shows too because they were afraid they might be next. But Mary Magdalene, she was at that cross because she knew there were worse things in this world than dying. And so she stood vigil with John and with Jesus' mother and with two other women, and, and she went through the whole terrible ordeal with them. Jesus had freed Mary from the clutches of evil, and so she took her place at his side, and she would not leave as he went through that six hours of terrible, terrible suffering on that cross. She watched as his hands, the hands that had freed her, were nailed to the cross. She listened as the voice that had commanded seven demons to come out of her shouted or cried out, it is finished. And then commanded his own spirit to depart. And with that, his body slumped, and he stopped breathing. But just to make sure he was dead, a Roman soldier took a spear and thrust it up into his side. But he didn't wince in pain, because he was gone. He was gone forever. Mary knew evil. That same evil that had stolen so much of Mary's life had now taken the one person that gave her life meaning. Yeah, Mary knew evil. She had had a personal relationship with it for years, and it seemed to her today that evil was grinning in triumph. The only thing that Eva had left behind for Mary was Jesus' broken body, and so she made that body her mission, her next mission in life. When Jesus died, the show was over for the crowd, so they left. The, the Sabbath was about three hours away, 
And so the religious leaders, they hurried home so no one would see them breaking the Sabbath. But Mary stayed. She stayed and she watched the soldiers pry Jesus' limp body off the cross and give it to two men, a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea and a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus. The bodies of the two thieves who died with Jesus were carted off to the valley of Hinnom and thrown onto the smoldering trash piles that burned on the south side of the city. But Joseph and Nicodemus headed in the opposite direction with Jesus' body. So Mary followed them all the way to a garden where there was a tomb. And she watched from a distance as Joseph and Nicodemus washed Jesus' body and then wrapped it with strips of cloth packed with aloe and myrrh and then carried that body into the tomb and rolled a big stone in front of the entrance and then slipped away into the darkness. Mary left too. But she determined in her heart that she would return once the Sabbath was over and she'd give Jesus a proper burial. Saturday was one of those lost days for the followers of Jesus. It was one of those days when, uh, when you're, trying, you're staring at the wall for hours and you're trying to figure out what happened and make sense of it all. One of Jesus' followers named Cleopas gives us a window into what Christians uh, all over Jerusalem were struggling with on that Saturday, the day after Jesus' death. Cleopas uh, just couldn't understand how evil had won. He said, uh, Jesus was powerful in word and in deed. Evil hadn't been able to touch him for three years. And yet, in just 24 hours, he was arrested, tried, and crucified by the religious elites. Cleopas said, we thought he was the promised one. We thought he was our Messiah, the Savior. But now he's gone. Gone forever. How can that be? How could evil have won? And if Cleopas was uh, struggling with those thoughts, you know Mary Magdalene was struggling too. But Saturday gave way to Sunday, and Mary had a mission. And so when the first rays of sunlight appeared, Mary and a band of women laden down with, with a, a load of uh, burial spices headed for the tomb to do for Jesus the one thing they could still do for him, give him a proper burial. But as they got closer to the garden, the women realized they, re they didn't have a way to move that big rock that was in front of the, the tomb. They didn't have a way to move it aside so they could get inside and do their work. And so as they're, they're talking about this and trying to figure it out, Mary got a glimpse of the tomb off in a distance, and her heart sank. She dropped everything and began to run towards the tomb because it looked to her as if that rock in front of the tomb was moved. And that, that spelled trouble. When Mary got to the tomb, her worst fears were confirmed. Jesus' body was gone. The enemies of Jesus must have come in the night, stolen his body. And now Mary has nothing. She has nothing. Mary didn't wait for the other women to catch up with her. She took off immediately to find John and Peter. And when she found them, she blurted out, They, she said, they, the enemies of our Lord, they, the henchmen of evil, they, they have taken our Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where, where they've put him. John and Peter left immediately, started running for the tomb. John was younger and faster than, than Peter, and so he outpaced him. An exhausted Mary followed far behind, trying to get back to the tomb. By the time John got to the tomb, the women who were with Mary were already gone. An angel had appeared to them and told them, Jesus isn't here. He's been risen. You need to go tell the disciples. So they left. When John got there, no one was there. And so he peered inside the tomb and he confirmed Mary's story. Jesus' body was gone. But oddly, his grave clothes were still there. About that time, Peter brushed, got there brushed past him and rushed right into the tomb and John followed him and as they looked at those grave clothes, it was just strange. It was odd. It was as if the body of Jesus had just passed through them and by the weight of their, or by their own weight of the cloth and the spice of it, it had just collapsed. And that, that 
Cloth that had been wrapped around his head had been neatly folded and placed beside the other, the grave clothes. No grave robber would do that. No, but they're not going to take the time to do that. Peter didn't know what to make of it all. But John looked at those grave clothes and he said, the only in his mind, he said, the only way that makes sense is if Jesus had actually risen from the dead. But he kept that to himself. When Peter and John left, Mary stepped back inside the tomb and began to weep because she was convinced that the people behind the crucifixion had come back in the night and they had taken Jesus' body to further desecrate it. Mary was so lost in her grief that when an angel appeared to her and asked her, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? She didn't even realize who she was talking to. She just spilled it all out again. And she said, they, they have taken away my Lord and I don't know where they put him. And as those words are tumbling off from her lips, it may have been a shadow that passed on the floor, may have been a sound that she heard. But Mary sensed that someone was behind her, so she turned to see who it was. But her eyes were so filled with tears and her her heart so filled with pain that she didn't realize that the blurry person standing right in front of her was Jesus. Jesus. She thought he was the gardener. I mean, who else would be there at this time in the morning? And when that stranger asked Mary the same question the angel had, why are you weeping? She gave a very similar answer to him. Sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you've put him, and I'll go get him. You don't don't even have to go with me. You don't have to help me bring him back. Just tell me. Just tell me where you put him. I'll go get him. You know, an angel was right behind Mary. The collapsed grave clothes were right beside of her. And Jesus was standing right in front of her. But Mary didn't know who the stranger was until he spoke one word. Just spoke one word. He spoke her name. He, spoke her name. he said, Mary. And as soon as he spoke her name, as soon as he said, Mary. She said, Rabboni, teacher. And she instinctively dropped to her knees in worship and clutched his robe so he wouldn't leave her again. Jesus reminded Mary he had to return to his father, but Mary got part of it right. Because Jesus promised each of us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. You see, the resurrection was the ultimate plot twist for Mary. She never saw it coming until Jesus spoke her name. Mary was sure evil had won and Jesus was gone forever until Jesus spoke her name. She couldn't see that the person standing right in front of her was Jesus until he spoke her name. The women that that had been to the tomb with her, they believed as soon as the angel told them he had risen. John believed when he saw the collapsed grave clothes. But Mary... Mary didn't believe until Je- that Jesus had risen from the dead until he spoke her name. Until that moment, she believed that they, they, the, the enemies of Jesus, the henchmen of the evil one, they, they had won, and Jesus was gone forever. But then Mary heard Jesus speak her name, and she knew that evil had lost, and she knew that hope was alive, and she knew that her Savior would never leave her. And never forsake her. Now, I don't know all the things that you're struggling with, going through right now. But I do know this. When we're struggling, it's easy to just believe that Jesus is gone and that evil is winning. That's where our mind goes. It's just easy to believe it. Bad things happen. We say, Jesus is gone. Evil is won. You know, when, uh, when your kids are breaking your heart, when someone you love slips through your fingers, when you, when you slip back into your addiction, when your boss says, I'm sorry, but this is your last paycheck. In moments like that, it's real easy to believe that Jesus is gone and that evil has won. If that's where you are today, The bad news is you're living in Saturday. 
You're living in that day between the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's where you are. But the good news is Saturday is followed by Sunday. The good news is the death of Jesus is followed by the resurrection of Jesus. And so when, you, when it looks like, when it looks like he's winning, hold on. Hold on because a plot twist is coming. See, when, the, when, when Satan and his henchmen are spiking the ball and, and taking a victory lap, brace yourself because Sunday's coming. Mary thought that Jesus was gone. She thought everything was hopeless. All was lost. And then the earth shook and the stone moved. Jesus spoke her name. Everything changed. And so if you're living in Saturday, I, I'm sorry you're there. I really am. That's a terrible place to be. But if you're living in Saturday, don't lose heart because a plot twist is in the works. It really is. Because it may be Saturday. Yes, it may. It may be Saturday in your life. But I promise you, I promise you, Sunday's coming. We're going to sing about that Sunday. So let's stand together and sing together. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory.
was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Cause our God has robbed the grave. Cause our God has robbed the
pray with me? Father, we thank you once again. Our hearts are so full of joy and hope because of what your son accomplished for us 2,000 years ago. We thank you for writing that greatest of plot twists into the story of redemption. We ask that as we leave here today, we would do so in the hope of Easter, in the hope of that plot twist, and that we would carry that with us everywhere we go. We love you. We thank you for the newness of life that you give to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Horizons Church, we love you. If you feel like you're living in Saturday, handling those dark emotions, next week we start a series talking about just that. So God bless you and have a very happy Easter. And if you're new, we'd love to see you over here.